Hey, and welcome to part two of sexual attraction. And we're right in the middle, right dead in the middle of pen <laughs> reproductive strategies. So let's continue. So uh, at the end of part one, we were talking about what sexy is, or specifically what sexy. Uh, what is sexy? Remember, sexy is a sign stimulus. Uh, so this is a stimulus that's going to trigger attraction, which is the fixed action pattern. And so uh, for men, uh, sexy or the sign stimuli are youthful, healthiness, and signs of fertility. Uh, that is, we think about evolution this way, and we can think about modules this way. Let me lay out a full description. Uh, let's say that uh, you're a man, uh, but during, uh, you know, early on uh, when you were a zygote, uh, during some cell division, a mutation occurred, and that mutation caused a change in the gene associated with uh, finding uh, youthfulness sexy. And again, this is evolutionary theory, basic evolutionary theory. Uh, these changes are caused by mutations, and then what happens is uh, the mutations occur. They're either unadaptive, if they're unadaptive to the environment, you die off, and you die off of that unadaptive gene uh, to yourself. However, if you have a mutation and that gene is adaptive, then that is going to make you more likely to survive, more likely to thrive, and more likely to have children and grandchildren and pass on that gene uh, to future generations. And so uh, you have mutations, unadaptive mutations die off, adaptive mutations uh, allow you to live and are passed on to future generations. So as an example, let's say that as a man you develop a mutation that says that you are attracted to women in their 60s or 70s and so that you want to have sex with women in their 60s or 70s. And you do that, and what happens is uh, you find that attractive. Uh, you know, that's the sexy sign stimulus. And so what happens is uh, you have sex with women who are well past uh, menopause, and so they cannot have children. And so the gene, the mutation, that says be attractive to older women uh, that dies off uh, in your generation with you. And that's how evolution works. And so that's how men came to see youthfulness, health, and fertility as sexy. Because at some point in the last 10,000 years or longer than that, uh, but most evolutionary psychologists think a lot of these modules popped up in the last uh, 10,000 years uh, during the stage where human beings were uh, starting to practice agriculture or herbiculture along with being a hunter-gatherer. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, during the last one uh, 10,000 years or so, uh, a mutation occurred. This mutation basically said uh, youthfulness in a woman uh, and some trait in a woman uh, that's in the, you know, that we would uh, classify as youthful, and I'll, I'll probably get to that in examples in a minute or so, uh, that is attractive, that is sexy to you. And so you're attracted to that, and the attractive behaviors may lead to a relationship and intercourse. Uh, and then that gene for that module is passed on to future generations. That's how you know, it'll, that's how evolution works, in case you need a refresher. Likewise, uh, for women, uh, they will see as sexy and be attracted to men who have successful genes. And these will be uh, genes which uh, cause physical powerfulness, uh, intelligence, and social dominance. So they, women, will be looking for men uh, who have evidence of these traits, being physically powerful and being able to dominate other men physically uh, and the environment physically, B 
being intelligent and being able to uh, dominate the environment and other uh, people uh, through intelligence and then also the social intelligence to become a dominant member uh, of your social group and these are the sign stimuli that women will find attractive which will cause them to be uh, you know uh, no wait a minute these are the sign stimuli uh, that w women will see as sexy which will cause them to be attractive to certain men so what specifically am I talking about now well I talked about that last week remember Cunningham uh, looked at uh, men making ratings of women's faces and he found that men found as attractive and also uh, he had them rate uh, you know uh, reproductive uh, you know uh, measures such as uh, how fertile do you think this uh, woman is how likely would they have an affair on their husband uh, so men rated neonatal features as uh, uh, you know as attractive that is larger eyes uh, mature uh, cheekbones as attractive and expressive features and so uh, a couple of these definitely are, are reflecting what I'm talking about that is men will see youth as something that is attractive and so the neonatal features Cunningham found those are youthful features uh, then uh, men will find uh, you know uh, signals of fertility attractive attractive so this is probably where in evolutionary theory the mature cheekbones come in because you could be attracted to very very young women uh, who could not have children uh, yet because they have not reached uh, men art however uh, in looking for mature cheekbones and having some Ma uh, maturity of the woman that would probably indicate that she is fertile so everything that we've seen so far that is attractive to men and women that falls into place with what we're talking about with evolutionary theory and mounts and genin uh, we talked about that where women were uh, rating men's bodies and they found that uh, the taller the men were the more attractive uh, and this is because taller men are visually dominating uh, that is they are taller and stand out and there's a lot of research on how the taller person in a group is automatically seen as a leader or automatically seen as an important uh, influencer of the group and then of course uh, taller people are usually more physically stronger than shorter people uh, then uh, they also found that a larger shoulder to waist ratio uh, was more attractive and that means uh, you know higher level of upper body strength uh, and large penises well this may sound like a joke uh, it really isn't I don't want to get into that uh, because there's a whole lecture I could give about penises uh, you know very seriously uh, about uh, the differences and what they mean but uh, that's another lecture uh, for another class but again we see that what we've seen so far in this class about what is attractive in men to women this also falls into place with evolutionary theory and so let's uh, talk about your dating survey uh, I'm recording this before I even put up the dating survey uh, but I've been using the data uh, the dating survey for about 20 years and so I am making some predictions about what will be on it and let's see and these predictions are mainly based on uh, evolutionary theory uh, so let's see how well these predictions uh, fall out uh, well first the prediction I'll make is based just on my experience uh, of uh, 18 years here at York College uh, the York students are going to be generally shy about this and I don't know how many people are going to do it uh, and uh, they'll generally be shy about getting into the whole role play of this is a real uh, you know uh, dating uh, you know uh, 
you know, a dating, uh, you know, uh, site, post, or whatever you call that. Oh, uh, outline, whatever, profile, you know, a real dating profile. Uh, you know, so we may not get people really giving a lot of information or being honest, uh, but here's generally what I predict. Uh, men will often give their height and weight measurements in their description of themselves. And they're going to more often mention sports or physical activities in describing themselves. And of course what this is doing is giving information about their height and general health. Uh, and so uh, somebody who is tall but a moderate weight, that would be somebody who possibly may be very physically strong. Uh, so when we see people, uh, men give that uh, height and weight, uh, that they're going to use that to convey or signal to women that they have that physical dominance and that physical strength. Likewise, they'll talk about sports uh, and physical activities. Uh, that is, I go whitewater rafting uh, to uh, illustrate the fact that they are physically fit and capable of handling situations like that. Uh, also, men will mention jobs and they're also going to mention possessions uh, to refer to social dominance. That is, you're going to mention your job to indicate a certain level of social dominance and then if the job is a managerial job or an upper level job, you're definitely going to mention that because that is going to indicate that you are, uh, you have the genes that will allow you uh, in life to get you know, ahead in life. And likewise, if you have possessions like a really nice car, you're going to mention that. Too bad we're not doing photos uh, because if you look at dating profiles on the dating sites, men usually will take photos of themselves with cars if they have nice cars to show off their possessions. And so again, this is saying, look, I have the genes that allow me to have a job where I can buy the fancy car. And while men are not consciously thinking that, uh, that is what's going on at the evolutionary level. That is, men know implicitly or explicitly or at least implicitly that what women are looking for, they're looking for dominant men. And so they will give evidence that they're dominant. And again, women find dominant sexy because uh, you know sexy is a sign stimulus. So dominance is a sign stimulus that leads to the woman being attracted to them. Uh, people are going to be more honest with the strategies to prepare for a date. Uh, because we're not talking about yourself, so uh, they're going to be a little bit more free uh, with this. And even though York students are characteristically shy here, uh, you know, why is that? York students are more conservative socially uh, than uh, college students I've run into at other colleges. Uh, and if you're interested, you, you can ask me about that in the synchronous section. Uh, section. Uh, you know, they're uh, you know uh, more sh you know conservative socially, and uh, uh, also uh, they're more conservative sexually. Uh, while this is okay in general, it also leads to an anti uh, you know uh, homophobic uh, anti-sexual homophobic. Uh, environment here at York. Uh, myself and other faculty here and students here have noted uh, this also. And again, if you're interested, ask me in the synchronous section. So in talking about uh, you know, what to do to prepare for a date, men or women are going uh, to suggest to men grooming uh, and clothing. And let me take those individually. In terms of grooming, uh, you know, you're going to want to smell nice, not be sweaty. Uh, you are going to have a nice haircut, uh, trimmed beard if you have a beard, uh, or whatever. Why? Uh, getting back to evolutionary psychology, 
uh, not stinking, uh, not being sweaty, not smelling like crap, means that you have a job where you don't have to like work in a ditch digging all day or work in a ditch digging through poop all day. And so if you smell nice, that is a uh, indication that you are dominant and intelligent and that you are doing better than most people where you don't have to do manual labor. And so anything that you can do to pretend uh, or really reflect that you have a good job and you don't have to dig and, and work all day and get sweaty, that's a good thing and that will be seen as attractive. Even if you do work, uh, you know, digging uh, holes all day, uh, you know that you should like clean up before a date. Uh, but that is something in general that uh, women are looking for. Likewise, uh, if you can go to the barber uh, every so often to get uh, trimmed up, that means you have the money to pay for the barber, uh, and also that means that you are in a job where it's important for you to look good. And so those are all indications that you are socially dominant. Uh, clothing, uh, most of the suggestions for clothing are going to be in terms of uh, expensive clothing, professional clothing. Again, uh, if you're wearing a suit, that indicates that you wear a suit to work. And so a date is no special thing, so you're just wearing the same thing as work clothes. And people who have to wear suits to work are usually in the upper echelons of society. Uh, they have the genes to get themselves there. Uh, likewise, bling. Uh, if you can afford the bling, uh, then uh, wear it because that will show your date and women that you have the ability to get a job where you can afford uh, the exp uh, expensive jewelry. Likewise, uh, go in an expensive car, even if you have to borrow a friend's, uh, because you're making it appear as if you are uh, wealthy enough to buy an expensive car. And also people talk about uh, lifts sometimes, shoe lifts or high heels or shoes, not you know, without saying high heels, shoes that make you look taller. Uh, again, because taller and being physical dom physically dominant are important. And sometimes when uh, we go through uh, strategies to prepare for a date, you know, people say go to the gym and work out. But I say, you know, what are you going to do if you have just a couple hours to do that? Working out is really not going to, for a couple hours, it's not going to make you bulk out immediately. So, uh, but people do mention that. Uh, and again, these are all signs stimuli based on what evolutionary theory says m women should find attractive in men. And uh, you know, not going to see a lot of you know you know going to see some honesty here, but not really not much. But where you know people usually talk about makeup, hair, uh, dress, and uh, my favorite, which very few people actually mention, and then when I mention it in class, people smile and laugh. But a push-up bra, uh, and they agree with it. So let me talk about each one individually. Uh, makeup. Okay, that's good, uh, but what specifically about makeup? And if you think about it, makeup generally is related to what Cunningham found as attractive in women's faces. Uh, a lot of makeup is around the eyes uh, and making the eyes appear bigger, and that is the neonatal features. Also, uh, you wear makeup to emphasize your cheekbones. Again, Cunningham talked about mature cheekbones. Uh, so uh, right away when we're talking about makeup, the makeup we're talking about is fitting right into what Cunningham found. Uh, hair, Cunningham didn't mention anything about hair, but remember I talked about health. And uh, you can tell a lot about how physically healthy someone is from their hair, and it's really hard to hide it. And of course, you could wear a weave, you could wear a wig. Uh, and again, that is a woman's version of borrowing your friend's really expensive car. You're making yourself appear healthier than you really are based on your hair. Uh, and so again, finding a woman who is healthy enough to have a child and raise the child, uh, that is something that you're uh, looking for. 
uh, the dress. Uh, the less, the better. Uh, to show off some skin. Why is that important, evolutionarily speaking? Again, health. Uh, you want to see skin to get a sense of how healthy the person is. Uh, this is growth, gross, but it's absolutely true. 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, it would be, be very common. You'd be talking to somebody, and while you're talking to them, a worm would poke out of their skin and crawl out and drop off onto the ground. Uh, that is, uh, we are doing really well as a race in terms of parasites now as we have forever. Uh, and so that's one reason why you want to be able to see skin. Uh, if a person has a healthy body and a healthy immune system, they have been able to avoid a lot of parasites. And so you won't see evidence of that in the skin. And push-up bra. Uh, Anybody figure that out yet? Well, as you get older, uh, women's breasts tend to sag. A push-up bra makes them appear perkier and younger. And so, of course, one of the evolutionary markers I talked about was youth and youthfulness. And so a push-up bra making the breasts appear perkier and uh, uplifted makes them appear that if you makes it appear as if you are a younger woman than you really are. Uh, so in the dating survey you see uh, you know generally everything I mentioned about evolutionary theory uh, plays out in the dating survey. Except what doesn't fit? Uh, usually we'll get these. Men will describe themselves as interested in a family, being reliable, being caring. This is interesting. Given the reproductive strategy I mentioned that men would adapt or adopt, excuse me, uh, these things can be seen as either out outright lies uh, or something that doesn't fit into the picture I've painted for you so far. And women describe themselves looking for men who are reliable, men who are caring, and men who are good, and ch good with children or interested in families. Uh, and you know, generally what we're talking about here is the idea of fidelity. That is, they are looking for men who are going to be reliable oh, sorry. and stay <laughs> with the family. And so either we have men saying that they are they have fidelity as a lie or as a ploy, and we've seen that in, in examples in the last couple of minutes. So that would not be that surprising. But then why are women looking for men who are going to be faithful? Uh, when they know it's really unlikely based on evolutionary theory. And again, this is not an explicit thought, but implicit knowledge about that. Well, uh, tune in to uh, part number three to find out.